It is Friday, so let's answer some questions from the listeners. You are Locked On Royals, your daily Kansas City Royals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are tuned into another edition of Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. I am your host, Jack Johnson. Go ahead and follow me on Twitter or X at JohnnyJ underscore 15 and catch us on wherever you get your podcasts. That can be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, YouTube. Really, there's no place out there you wouldn't be able to find this podcast episode. If you're a first-time listener and you want to know more about me and this show, well, I'm based here in Kansas City. I work at Sports Radio 810 WHB, doing some hosting, co-hosting, and a little bit of producing. But when it comes to this podcast, when you click on this link, you know that you're going to be getting 30 straight minutes of Royals baseball. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more because this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Well, it is a Friday, which means the mailbag Friday, and it's completely dedicated to the listeners. Whatever questions you may have, uh, you can send them my way. Unfortunately, for the second straight week, we're not going to get to every single question because we had that many coming in through Twitter and through YouTube. So I'll try my best to give everybody a proper answer, spend enough time on each one, uh, and give you guys a good 30-minute episode. So let's dive into it with question number one. It comes from Patrick. At what point do we make Freddie for me in a royal for life and give him the keys to the city? Well, we all know Freddie for me is a huge fan favorite uh, here in Kansas City. We did an episode yesterday about him being an everyday player. I stand by it. He's in the lineup tonight against Tarek Skubal. Uh, and I'd imagine most of the times that there is a lefty on the bump. Freddie Fermain is going to be in the lineup. Though his splits against righties are not bad at all. He hits about 281 with a 315 OBP against righties this year, actually in his career for that matter. Uh, so I think there is a chance for him to play every single day. Now, as for being a Royal for life, what if there is an extension? I'm not going to rule it out. I think that there could be a possibility for a two year extension or a three year extension uh, for a cheaper amount of money just because the Royals want to reward him. But also, he's 29 years old. He's almost going to be 30. Still plenty of years of control. So it's not an immediate uh, need at this point in time. But I do love the question. I love that Freddie Fermin has become a fan, fan favorite here in Kansas City. Next question comes from I Buy Cards. Uh, who is the best player in baseball right now, and why is it Bobby Wood Jr.? Well, we know Bobby Wood Jr. leads in war on fan graphs. He's now got uh, half, I think it's, 0.5, if I'm not mistaken, over Aaron Judge in terms of the war race. Uh, so in some metrics, you could say he is the most valuable player in baseball, but I stand by the fact that I think as long as Aaron Judge stays healthy, we know how the voting is going to go. We know that Aaron Judge is likely going to win it, but that doesn't mean Bobby Wood Jr. can't get any votes or at least make it very close here in the final 50 games or so of the season. Derek asked, do you think we see John Rave or Tyler Gentry get a shot in the bigs before next year? I think Tyler Gentry could. It wouldn't shock me if in the September call-ups, they bring him up as the extra bat instead of Drew Waters or Nick Prado or CJ Alexander. I think they would have to make a roster move, if I'm not mistaken, uh, because he's not on the 40-man roster. I am going to double check that on the fly here, because uh, if he's not on the 40-man roster, they may just give the the easy decision to Drew Waters, you know, just to bring him up and not have to make any sort of roster move. But uh, Tyler Gentry, he actually is on the 40-man roster. So, yeah, it wouldn't need to be anybody getting bumped off the 40-man. You would just call him up. So I'm going to say possible, over 50% maybe for T Tyler Gentry. Not much over 50%, but I don't know if I'm there yet with John Rave. I think it'd either be Drew Waters or Tyler Gentry getting the call for an outfielder uh, coming up in September. Walk a season asked, what was the deadline move that you were hoping the Royals pulled off? Example, an outfield batter or another reliever. I would have loved to see them pull off a Taylor Ward or Luis Renjifo trade just because that would have been a move for this year and next year. But since the Angels didn't trade them at all, it makes me think the price tag was a little bit too high on those guys. So for me, I think that you know those two options could still be revisited in the winter. I just don't think that the price was very reasonable for anybody out there. And the Angels, I thought, did horribly at the trade deadline with the exception of what they got in return for Carlos Estevez because there were some valuable guys on their team they could have traded for prospects. But I think it's the fear of, you know, basically signaling to the fan base you're not close to winning anytime soon. But I think the average fan or Angels fan would know 
the Angels are not close to winning anytime soon. So those would have been the two guys I would have, or at least one of those two guys I would have loved for the Royals to acquire. This one comes from Andrew. Do you think we immediately give Ursig the closer spot or stick him uh, in the eighth inning? I think that Lucas Ursig is going to be the reliever that comes in when it's the highest leverage point of the game. For example, if the Royals tonight have everything go smoothly in the first six innings and they're up by two and you go to Angel Serpa in the seventh and then Hunter Harvey in the eighth and they go one, two, three, I think Lucas Ursig would be the closer. If there's a scenario tonight in which it's first and second, nobody out, the Royals lead by one in the bottom of the eighth inning or the bottom of the seventh inning, I think Mac Quattrero would go to Lucas Ursic. I think he's going to be the fireman where he has the belief of you put your best reliever in when it's the most important spot of the game because you don't want to put somebody in there who's not and then they blow the save opportunity for the guy in the ninth or you never get to that point. Uh, so to me, that is what I think Luke, Lucas Ursic's role is going to be not just a guy you save for the ninth inning every single time out. I think we'll see him in a variety of different roles uh, because he can close out games, and he also can be a setup guy, and he also could be that guy to get you out of jams if there's runners on in the seventh inning. Next question comes from JC Retro Athletics. Rank them from fastest to slowest. Bobby Wood Jr., Terrence Gore, Gerard Dyson, Dyron Blanco, Lorenzo Kane. I think Bobby would be the fastest. Then I would go... Man, in a straight line, I'll say Terrence Gore, Dyson, oh man, Dyson, Blanco, Kane. I think that's about right. I think in the way that you put each player there, I think that's accurate. I always thought Gore was the fastest player between him and Dyson, but Dyson was the much better base runner. Um, Dyron Blanco definitely deserves a nod for that. He's kind of like Gore of really fast, but maybe not the best base runner. And I think Lorenzo Kane just by default, because he's 6'3". I mean, he's not going to be as fast as the other guys there. But Bobby, to me, is the fastest. Then I'd go Gore, Dyson, Blanco, and Kane. Next question comes from Brett. Did the Royals solve their bottom of the lineup and outfield problems? I think for the most part, yes. I think Hunter Renfro and the way he's played since May 1st has given them a huge boost in that lineup. Kyle Isbell's defense and being pretty much an average hitter is just fine for center field. And then if Melendez can get back to the form that he was showing at the beginning of July... Uh, before he really got hurt in Boston. I think it was toward the middle of June. I think it was June 12th is the stat I'd always go back to. June 12th until he got hurt in Boston. You get that version of MJ Melendez for the final two months. I think the outfield problems are just fine. Um, I, I don't think they are as substantial or as glaring as they were earlier in the year. So yes, to answer your question, I do think that it's not as big of an issue as it was back in April and back in May. Tyler asks, it's the middle of September. Who's the 7th, 8th, and ninth inning guys? I think if John Schreiber comes back and he's fully healthy and he's pitching well, he's my 7th inning guy. Hunter Harvey becomes my 8th inning guy, and Lucas Ursig becomes my ninth inning guy. But Mac Quattrero doesn't really use the bullpen like that. There's going to be nights on Hale Serp as the 7th inning guy, or Will Smith is, or James MacArthur is, and then somebody gets bumped to the 8th inning, or there's going to be nights in which Harvey throws the seventh, Lucas Ersig throws the eighth, and James MacArthur throws the ninth. So I think there's a lot of different mixing and matching, but if it were my call, I'd go Schreiber, Harvey, and Ersig for my seventh, eighth, and ninth inning spots uh, late in September. Salvi, uh, I won't be able to say that over uh, the podcast here. I do love the username. We'll go KC Sports Center for the username here. Uh, why have we not taken a chance on John Raven AAA? He's batting pretty well and could be an upgrade over Kyle Isbell's offense. Also, what happened to Reagan's on that start where his Vila was down three to four miles an hour? Um, as for John Rave, yeah, I just don't think that he's going to make that jump out uh, of the big league level, not in a playoff push. Kyle Isbell is going to be this team's center fielder for the rest of the year. Unless he gets hurt, he is their guy moving forward. I like John Rave, but I also bring up CJ Alexander and Drew Waters tearing it up in AAA this year. Didn't translate to the big league level, and they've played now at the big league level. Uh, John Rave is not. I don't think they're going to put him in that type of spot to close out the year. As for Cole Reagans, I mean, it was something to be alarmed with, but also J.J. Piccolo came out and said that they had discussions about it. They're not worried about it. And if the Royals were concerned, he would have been pulled from that start. I think a little bit of it is Cole Reagans taking velocity off to have better command and also just not to burn out his arm. Like if it's five starts in a row of him hitting 92 and 93 and topping out at 94, we got a problem. But last start uh, against Chicago, he was still hitting 96 uh, and 95 and 96 pretty late into his start. And I think for the most part, that's what he's going to sit at. I, I think that 
we fell for how hard he could throw last year. But there were times that he lost all command when he was throwing 98, 99, 100. I think he'd much rather have better command, lower velocity, and he still gets a lot of strikeouts for that matter. So tonight we'll have to wait and see uh, what it looks like off the mound, but I don't think the Royals are too overly concerned with that. We're going to take our first break of the show. When we come back, we got plenty more questions to get into next on Locked on Royals. You are tuned into Locked on Royals and the Locked on Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson, and you can find me on Twitter, Rex, at JohnnyJ underscore 15. Two sponsors we want to give a shout out to, starting with FanDuel. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So go and head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer because FanDuel is the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. And if you are thinking about putting some money down tonight, you got Tarek Skubal and Cole Reagans on the bump. Uh, for both these teams, two guys that have been dominating over the last few months. Um, I would look into strikeout totals. And if you're Cole Reagans, I'd bet the over on six and a half. And if it's Tarek Skubal, probably in the same department, I'd bet the over on the seven and a half. Although the Royals don't strike out a lot. So maybe you could look into that and say it's not going to happen. Although the Royals have a lot of non-everyday players in the lineup. So I'd bet the over on both Cole Reagans and Tarek Skubal strikeout totals tonight in Motown. We also want to let you know about Supply House. Get supplies from the site that's made for the skilled trades at SupplyHouse.com. SupplyHouse.com is a reliable way to order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical products online. Their easy-to-use website is packed with helpful resources and the latest product info to help you get the job done right. Shop a complete inventory of over 200,000 parts from over 400 top brands and get your order delivered right to your door with fast shipping from coast to coast. Need help with an order? Get expert support and industry-leading service from the friendliest folks in the business and talk to a real person every time. Pros in the skilled trades can get a competitive edge by joining SupplyHouse.com's free Trade Master program. Every Trade Master gets access to a dedicated phone line, free shipping, and discounts on every order. Join the thousands of trade pros already benefiting from their free membership at SupplyHouse.com and order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical supplies from anywhere with just a few clicks at SupplyHouse.com. Com. We're going to jump back over to Twitter and get into our next round of questions. This one comes from Ben. I live in Springfield, Missouri, and get to see the Naturals play the Cardinals double A often. They play again in September. What's the likelihood that I get to see Jack Caglione play? I remember watching Bobby come up, and those are some of my favorite baseball memories. Well, good question there, Ben. I wish I could be more exact with my answer. Right now, he's down in Arizona, went two for three in his professional debut. Uh, He only played five innings, by the way. So multi-hit game, didn't play the full game. I I think that's exactly what you were hoping for from Jack Caglione. I guess I could see a world in which he gets up to double A before this year ends. I just think they're going to slow play it a little bit. I'd imagine that he will get to quad cities. I don't know if they've had a prospect like this before in a long time. Like I think in most scenarios, I would say, they're going to slow play. No way he gets the double A, but it wouldn't shock me. Like, I'm not going to put it at a 0% chance. I might put it at like 15 to 20, uh, maybe a little bit less than that. I do think he goes to quad cities, but right now I just don't know if the Royals will fast track him unless he just tears up high A pitching. Like that will be the way he, if he goes straight to quad cities and hits 400, they're not going to waste his time with high A pitching. They'll just send him straight to double A to get a little bit more work in before the season ends. So that's, I think, the best gauge of knowing where Jack Caglione will be uh, by by September. So the next month or so, we'll we'll get a better gauge of how he does against the professional pitching. RJ asks, why is Massey not playing every day? Are they trying to take it easy on his back? Yeah, I think that they're trying to still ease him into it because he had to be sidelined twice, right? At the beginning of the year, he couldn't play because of the back. Tried to uh, Tried to go back and not really have any restrictions. And in the end, he ended up having it flare back up and put him back on the injured list. So I don't think the Royals are going to make him an everyday second baseman for the rest of the year. It's why Paul DeYoung was acquired. It's why Michael Garcia is playing more second base so they can have that flexibility and not overdo it and risk another injury that can maybe put him out for the rest of the year. So that's why I think he's not an everyday player uh, in 2024. Bobby Litt Jr. asked, do you think the trades JJ made solidified our chances of the postseason? What grade would you give the Royals? I'll give them a B plus. I think that the Lucas Ersig trade was phenomenal because of the years of control, and they didn't give up any of the guys that 
I was told were untouchable, right? That I, I think the guys that were untouchable in their organization, they kept around. Um, the Paul DeYoung trade wasn't a huge one, but they gave up a lottery ticket guy. Uh, you add Hunter Harvey into that. Hunter Harvey, I think, gets better, but you have him for next year. And then Michael Lorenzen gives them a little bit of an upgrade in the rotation. So B-plus would have been an A if they could have landed a, a, a traditional leadoff hitter, a high OBP guy. I think that would have put them in a very good spot to hang on to a wild card spot the rest of the way, and then maybe even make a strong push of the division. But I think I'll give them a B plus overall with what they were able to bring in. So I, I do give kudos to JJ Piccolo. Aiden asks, uh, with Kyle Wright coming back next year, does he have a chance to replace Alec Marsh in the rotation if he is healthy? Um, I would say that Kyle Wright will be handled a little bit like Chris Bubich um, in the way that I don't think you go into spring training assuming that he's going to get the spot. I think that you hope he wins a, a bullpen spot. He's the long relief guy. And then if, if he succeeds, you could always work him back into the rotation. But Kyle Wright really struggled before his injury too. So it's not like uh, that one outlier year in which he won 20 games is Kyle Wright. Because out, other than that year, outside of that year, he has not been a very good starter at this level. So, no, I don't think that he is penciled in as the starter. He'll have a chance to win it in spring training. But I think first things first for him is just making the team, especially coming off a, a shoulder surgery, right? Because it's not Tommy John. It's a shoulder surgery, with, which can be a little bit more problematic and harder to recover from. Uh, Harry's dad asks, when will Bubich get a defined role? I see the best for Ersig, Bubich, Long, and MacArthur from best to worst. Um I think that Chris Bubich will have a defined role at some point, but he also is a unique pitcher. Like he's a half starter, half reliever. It's kind of a one inning guy. I think they're still trying to build him up a lot. And if you can keep building him up, getting him out there more and more, there's going to come an opportunity in which he comes in another high leverage spot. He already had to in game two of that doubleheader against St. Louis. So I do think he's going to get a more defined role surely before September but the bullpen just has a lot of spots up for grabs as well. So uh, to me, I don't know if those are my best four. I think it's Ursig, Harvey, Schreiber when healthy, and then Sam Long. Um, and then not far after that, I think it'd be Chris Bubich. So I think Chris Bubich, just because we haven't seen him in a super high leverage spot multiple times in a row like we have the others with Harvey, Ursig, Long, um, John Schreiber, that's something that could push him in the top four for me. But not a bad question. I know a lot of people out there are wondering what the role is for Chris Bubich. Um, Charles asked, do you see us calling up Velasquez? Or do you see him ending the year in AAA? I think it comes down to how Paul DeYoung fares. Uh, if Paul DeYoung hits well, I don't think we'll see Nelson Velasquez again this year. Uh, he hasn't been hitting too well now. He went through a little bit of a cold stretch in Omaha. Um, he's walking a little bit more. But it's just not as as drastic of a change as you would have hoped for with him getting a reset in Omaha. So if Paul DeYoung continues to hit, he's only played in one game for the Royals before tonight. I don't think they're going to make a move to bring him back up unless they were to move on from Garrett Hampson and just get another home run bat off the bench uh, from the right side of the plate. So those are my thoughts on Nelson Velasquez. MJ Melendez enthusiast asked, what do you think uh, are the leading guys to be called up in Kansas City or called up to Kansas City? during September, and hopefully an eventual playoff run. Um, if they do call up a few guys in September, I'd imagine the pitcher getting called up will be Alec Marsh, and the guy getting called up for off the bench would be either Drew Waters, Tyler Gentry, or Nelson Velasquez. I think those are the three that make the most sense there. They'll only expand the roster to 28. I'd imagine it'd be one pitcher and one hitter, and those would be the two guys that I would go with there. Uh, this one comes from SPP. Out of all of our bullpen arms, who will be here um, for years to come? Well, under control would be Ursig. He's got four or five more years under control. Hunter Harvey's under control for next year. Schreiber's under control for next year. MacArthur's under control for next year. Serpa is. Um, I think Will Smith has a player option. I'd have to go back and look at that. But there's five guys right there. Sam Long was a minor league deal guy. They might try to bring him back. I don't think he's under contract, though, for next year because he was a minor league deal guy. If he pitches well, though, I'd imagine they'd give him another one-year deal or maybe a two-year deal. Uh, so there's a lot of guys you're going to see back from this bullpen, which is a good thing because then when you go into the offseason, you can just add a reliever or two, unlike this past year where they had to overhaul the entire bullpen and spend a lot of money with it. You can maybe spend $10 million on one guy now to really solidify 
the back end of the bullpen. So a lot of guys will be coming back for 2025. Okay, we're going to take our final break of the show. When we come back, we'll wrap it up with our final questions from our mailbag. But before we do that, a shout-out to Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you canvas analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. When we come back, we'll wrap up the week next on Locked On Royals. You are tuned into Lockdown Royals and the Lockdown Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson, and you can find me on Twitter, X, at JohnnyJ underscore 15. Our final sponsor is going to be Liquid IV. And if you are one of those people that doesn't like to drink a lot of water or you find yourself dehydrated often, uh, just go get a Liquid IV to put into your water. I'm somebody that likes to drink a lot of water, but I also like the flavor. Um, you know, I used to drink a lot of Gatorades and Propels growing up. So liquid IVs aren't far off that, and they really keep you hydrated. You know, if you've gone out from a night drinking, you go to a concert and it's really hot out, or you wake up the next morning not feeling good, liquid IVs are going to make you feel so much better. And also, if you're into working out and you need to stay replenished, you know, again, liquid IVs are a really good thing to use when putting in your water, and I think they taste really good. So here's what you need to do. You need to go to liquidiv.com and get 20% off your first order. And you can just use the code MLB at checkout over at liquidiv.com. That's 20% off your first order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code MLB at liquidiv.com. All right, let's get to our final round of questions. This one comes from Jeremy or Gurmy. Dreaming at the what-ifs, how could the Royals stand in a five-game or seven-game playoff series? Even though it's so far away, how would they match up with the juggernauts like the Yankees or the Orioles, who they haven't looked good against so far? Well, we know even with um, regular season totals and the head-to-head matchups, we, they don't really mean much when it comes to playoff time because there's added pressure now. It's sold-out stadiums. It's colder there. There's more on the line. And the Royals going into the playoffs, if they get there, will have virtually no pressure on them. I mean, I'm going to be anxious. You're going to be anxious. It's going to be a high-stress situation. But as for the team itself, there's no pressure on them, right? If they make the playoffs, they're one of the, the best stories, the coolest turnaround stories in Major League Baseball history. They play the Yankees or the Orioles. They have all the pressure on their side. Now, I think in a best of five, it's going to be tough for the Royals to win against either of those teams because I just don't think they're that great of a road team. And if they get to the playoffs, you know, how are Cole Reagans and Seth Lugo looking at the very end, guys that have shattered their career high in innings, right? Are they going to be on fumes at that point? I also think bullpen is a huge part of success in the bowl or in the postseason. And you just have to ask the 2014 and 15 Royals. You don't have a good bullpen. You're not going to go very far. And that's clearly an issue for the Royals right now, but it would still be fun regardless. You roll the dice, you see what happens. I think they could have a favorable pitching matchup in a game or two of a best of five or a best of seven. But for the most part, it's about getting your foot in the door now and you roll the dice. Anything can happen in October. It's not so much about matchups anymore in the regular season. I think it'd be a blast to go to the Bronx or Camden Yards to play the Orioles or the Yankees in a best of three for the wild card series. Uh, but if they get to the ALDS, they've already achieved more than anybody thought would be possible. But good question there because I know a lot of people are starting to wonder about that over the final two months of the season. Uh, Danny asked any updates on Cags down in Arizona. Well, he went two for three in his professional debut. I'd imagine he'll get a few workouts there, a few games in there, and then they'll send him up to Quad A, uh, High A, um, or Quad Cities High A. Got tongue twister there um, before the end of the month, so we can face some more advanced pitching, and then they'll make the call from there, depending on how he fares uh, against that High A pitching. This one comes from Max Freddie for me, despite only playing sixty nine games, is second among all Royals. Royals hitters in war. That is insane. At what point do the Royals say enough is enough and make him an everyday player? And what role do you see him fitting in with a playoff push? I think he should be an everyday player. We had an episode on it yesterday. I think that he's too good uh, behind the plate to only catch him once or twice a week. I think offensively, he is a perfect fit for the six hole or the seven hole. I like what he brings to the table. What his role would be on a playoff team? I think somebody that's in the lineup every single day, whether he's catching or he's going to be DHing. So I'm right there with you. Freddie Fermin does not need to be coming off the bench, you know, once or twice every single week. It needs to be a five to six days a week that he's playing in the lineup. 
Michael asked if the Royals would have part ways with Adam Frazier or Garrett Hampson. Thanks, as always, for considering all the questions, Jack. Um, no problem at all. I love trying to get to as many questions as I can. Um, if he does get demoted, one of those guys is sent down. I'd imagine Nick Lofton just gets the call back up uh, just because those are two guys that can play the infield and the outfield, and Nick Lofton can do the same thing. So I think that would be my answer uh, with who would get the call up. SPP asked, is this season's MJ's last chance? Also, if you had to pick uh, one of the uh, one for the offseason, would you rather trade for Ward or Reen Hefo? Um, I think Taylor Ward would be the better option because I love the underlying data there. And as for MJ and this being his last chance, um, I don't think so unless they go all in and try to bring in a left fielder uh, in this coming offseason. I have to go look at the free agent market. But to me, I don't think it's MJ's last chance. Maybe his last chance to be a confirmed everyday player. He may move to a bench bat after next year if he really doesn't turn things on here in the second half. Um, Eli asked, we have plenty more questions to get into, so I don't want to uh, miss anybody here on the final 10 here. Uh, Eli does ask, is there any MLB rule that prohibits John Sherman from hypothetically giving Juan Soto 50% 50 of his stake of his energy company as a signing bonus? For some reason, it doesn't feel as wrong as what the Dodgers did with Otani. Yeah, uh, that's not really in my area of expertise. Juan Soto will be a highly coveted free agent. I just don't think that he's going to end up in Kansas City. It's a it's a good thought. You know, it'd be a loophole to consider there from what the Dodgers were able to do with Otani. But I think that either Juan Soto goes back to the Yankees or he's going to go to a West Coast team. He's going to a massive market team uh, coming up in the free agent sweepstakes for him. Travis asks, how hard is it to draft and develop a toolsy center fielder? The last one who was above average was Beltron in 95. Yeah, I mean, that's been a problem for the Royals for a while now. I mean, they hit on Bobby Wood Jr. You'd love to see them hit on another Bobby Wood Jr. type player for center field. But with Caglione being a first baseman, might have to wait till next year's draft to see if they can take a first rounder and turn him into a superstar. Austin asks, not a full baseball question, but with the Hall of Fame game tonight, would you say you're more excited for the end of the Royals season and possible playoffs or the start of the Chiefs' quest for a three-peat? Well, me being a baseball guy, I'm going to say the Royals because uh, we haven't experienced a September like this, an August and September like this since 2015, for that matter. I mean, 2016 and 17, it was always an uphill battle. I mean, they traded for Melky Cabrera in 2017. They had a wild card spot, and like a week or two later, it was gone. And it was an uphill battle the rest of the way. This feels a lot different. It's very exciting. It's exhilarating. Uh, the Chiefs, of course, I'm excited for. I'll be pumped for both, but... You know, it's the beginning of the NFL season and playoff time for baseball. I think I'm going to lean toward baseball there. Uh, this one comes from RB Carr. Game 7 ALCS against Soto, Judge, and Stanton do up in the bottom of the ninth. Casey leads 2-1. to one. Who closed out the game? Give me Lucas Ursig. I would want no other pitcher out there on the mound. Give me the heat. Give me your best bullpen arm. Uh, give me the guy who was brought here to win you a game like that. So no doubt in my mind, it would be Lucas Ursig. Kate asked, what's a reasonable record going into September for us to feel confident? I'd have to go and check uh, what that would be, but I'm assuming with 30-ish games to go, um, let's say roughly the game 132 mark, you would want to be, I think, what would that be? Or would that make any sense? No, it wouldn't be 30 games. I think it'd be around 25 maybe. So with 25 games to go, I would love to see the Royals at like the... 65 to 70 win mark. I think that would be pretty for all that doesn't give them many wins in the month of August. I think I'm way out of whack here on what that total would be. If you can just need, I would say 10 wins in September, 10 to 12 wins in September, that would put them at, at like 76. So that's what I should have said. Not, not 65 to 70. If you can get to 70 to 75 wins by the end of August, I think that's pretty good. I think that would be a good, a tool to measure of of where the win loss record should be going to September, so you're not putting a ton of heat on having to be extraordinary. Maybe on the upper hand of 75 to 77, mid 70s might be the best total there uh, before they hit the month of September. Um, this one comes from, uh, let's see, Corey. Do you think Tyler Gentry is up in KC before September? Yeah, I think there's a chance. I'd put it just over 50 percent there, um, but I just don't think anything is imminent. Caleb asks, what do you think our starting lineup will be for Game One of the playoffs? Also, who do you think the starting pitcher will be? I think Cole Reagans would be the starter. And then I think for the lineup, it'd be Garcia, Bobby Wood Jr., Vinny Perez, Renfro. Uh, let's go Massey, Fermin. And then who would the 8-9 be left there? I think that would have 
uh, Melendez and Isbell, would that be? Or you could flop Massey and Melendez. I think Melendez would be in that lineup. So I, I think, yeah, the final two hitters there would be Melendez and Isbell for me. Um, this question comes from Brett. Um, allow me to make a case for the Royals to be the third wild card. If the division doesn't happen, presumably the AL West winner will be the division winner. Uh, given that the current division leader is Houston is currently eight or so games behind the division winner number two, currently New York and Baltimore. Oh, this is the long, um, thread here. Let's see here with the time we have left, you know, Brett, I think I'm actually going to answer that question. I apologize to do this because we're on time constraints here. I'll answer that one directly, directly for you. Cause you messaged me. Um, I don't want to leave you waiting on that. So a good question. I'm just going to answer that directly on Twitter so I can get to these final few ones here. I want to give a thought out answer on that. Jeff asks, here's a question for Mailbag Friday. I'll admit up front, it's one of those questions that might have variety. Will having a new stadium in a few years help revenue-wise? Uh, sign Witt to an extension in about seven years. If he chooses, he wants to opt out a reworker's deal. Um, I do think you know, the extra revenue would help a little bit. I also think just winning baseball games and getting to the playoffs will be an added incentive there. I think Bobby Wood Jr. loves Kansas City. He wants to stay there, and I'd put money on it that I think he re-signs or he reworks his deal before his contract is done. Thomas asks, going into 2024, I would have counted this season as success if the Royals finished above 500. But now I'm thinking wild card game. First place in division might be pushing it. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I just think getting into the playoffs would be an absolute win for the Royals. So I'm right there with you. doesn't need to be a division winning team. You get into the playoffs, that's a success in my eyes. Danny asks, what is your opinion? Uh, what, in your opinion, is the optimal Royals lineup moving forward now that the deadline is passed? I'm just going to go exactly what that playoff lineup is. Having Fermin out there every single day, um, Paul DeYoung plays every other day, maybe twice a week, three times a week, and you round it out with uh, Massey, uh, Melendez, and Isbell there at the bottom part of the order. But the front six, I feel really good about. And Ben, why is Adam Frazier still on my baseball team? They want a left-handed bat off the bench that can play multiple positions. That, that's the only reason I can tell you. All right, that's going to do it for another edition of Locked On Royals and the Locked On Podcast Network. I've been your host, Jack Johnson. And before we say goodbye, thank you for making Locked On Royals your first listen today. For your second listen, enjoy the Locked On MLB podcast. Host Pat Sullivan, a.k.a. Sully, is here daily to provide national expertise with his trademark humor to help you get ready for the MLB playoffs here in the dog days of summer. Prepare for the Fall Classic with Sully, who has it all covered every single day on Locked On MLB, available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. When we come back on Monday, we'll have a full breakdown of that Tiger series and a preview of the Boston Red Sox. But until then, you take it easy, Kansas City.